From the Soaking Newsroom, here's your weekly local news recap. I'm Stephen Vier. On August 4th, one person suffered a minor burn during an early morning house fire in the 5200 block of South 170th Lane in SeaTac. When firefighters from Canton Tukwila arrived, they found a two-story house on fire that was mostly a framework of dimensional lumber. Flames had spread to the attic of the house next door that was also under construction. A second alarm was called to get more firefighters on scene so that there was sufficient manpower to fight the first house fire, attack the attic fire in the second house, and protect a third nearby home occupied by a family of five. An adult male suffered a burn while trying to move his vehicle away from the fire at the second home. He was examined and treated by King County Medic 1 personnel. The framed house where the fire started is a total loss and the nearby homes were significantly damaged. Once remnants of the framed house are knocked down to make it safe for entry, investigators will examine the site to determine the cause of the fire. Photos and more at SeaTacBlog.com. James Nichols was unanimously selected on July 28th by the Des Moines City Council as the new city manager pending final contract negotiations. The selection of Nichols was confirmed after a five-month national search that ended with Nichols and current Des Moines assistant city manager Michael Matthias as the top two finalists. Nichols has 21 years of local government experience and recently was the county manager of Douglas County, Nevada. He held his first city management jobs in Washington state for the cities of Chehalis and Olympia. Former mayor and council member Dave Kaplan said Nichols has a process of learning the specifics of a task or job by working with and riding along with city staff members, and that during his tour of the city, he got out and talked with city workers. None of the other candidates did that, Kaplan said. Nichols also sat down and talked with residents at an open house who spoke highly of his ability to communicate. Mayor Matt Pena said that while the city had a very strong pool of candidates from which to choose, that the selection process was still quite a journey. Details at waterlandblog.com. A move to add two officers to the Burien Police Department at an estimated cost of $415,000 was debated for over an hour at the August 1st Burien City Council meeting. CD Manager Cameron Garall and Burien Police Chief Scott Kimmerer are asking the council's permission to hire a patrol officer and a sergeant to work with the new downtown emphasis patrol. The move drew heavy fire from council members Lauren Berkowitz and Nancy Tosta before being delayed to the next meeting for further debate and decision. Chief Kimmerer said his department has experienced a monumental increase of almost 20,000 calls for service last year for his 27-member patrol force. He noted that violent crimes are down, but nonviolent crimes like car prowls and shoplifting are up. I am not for adding more police officers, Council Member Nancy Tosta said. I don't think we have that funding. Mayor Lucy Krakowiak said she did support the additional officers in light of a community survey and that the council was developing ideas to confront the non-criminal aspects of the city's problems. Details at btownblog.com. The SeaTac City Council soundly rejected a surprise move by former mayor and council member Rick Forschler to get approval of a November general election proposition to have an elected full-time strong mayor replace the current city manager form of government. All council members except Forschler voted against the proposal. In other actions, the council also asked city staff to prepare a resolution for later council action that would state that the city promotes ethnic diversity. The council also passed a code of ethics for council members after adding a sentence banning any member from holding two public offices. This was a reaction to former Mayor Mia Gregerson, who was, until her defeat last November, both a city council member and a member of the Washington State House of Representatives. Details at SeaTacBlog.com. Studies show that kids who play an instrument develop stronger communication abilities, have greater brain development, and have a very high graduation rate. But right now, some kids in the Highline School District won't have that opportunity because they simply don't have an instrument. You can help by drinking beer and listening to the blues. The Rotary Club of Des Moines and Normandy Park, Washington proudly presents the 7th Annual Poverty Bay Blues and Brews Festival, Saturday, August 27th. This epic blues extravaganza is the prime fundraiser for our Music for Life program, expanding music to youth in our local schools. Enjoy a day filled with local blues together with a variety of fine brews from area breweries. The festival will be located on the shores of Puget Sound at the Des Moines Beach Park. Advanced tickets are just $30 and available at drinktomusic.com. 
enjoy some blues, drink some brews, and keep music in our schools. <clears throat> That's schools. The 7th Annual Poverty Bay Blues and Brews Fest, Des Moines, Washington, Saturday, August 27th. Drinktomusic.com. Time now for The Main Problem. Commentary from senior writer Jack Maine. We need more police. Crime is getting out of hand. That means we have to raise taxes. Oh no, cut some of those city expenses. Don't cut police. We need more, not fewer. So we can cut the planning department staff. Oh no, then the addition to my house will never get approved. Well then, how about cutting city clerical staff? They aren't needed. Absolutely not. The city is still behind in sending me the public documents I demanded. Cut staff salaries. The city staff people make far too much money. Oh my, so many city employees have quit because we cut salaries that all citizen requests are on hold. What will we do? Maybe ask the legislature to fix the terrible way that taxes are collected and spent in Washington. Maybe what we really need is to have the taxpayers learn how government really works and then demand a total basic overhaul of the outdated and totally inflexible way we have to finance government. Maybe we need a fresh new plan without levies, special levies, and costly bond issues. Maybe even state and local governments should join the rest of us in the 21st century. Small cities in the states are facing financial doom unless some changes are made. Burien, SeaTech, Des Moines, and even Normandy Park are being hampered by unworkable and outdated state tax regulations. In the final take, until now we've refrained from talking about the strained and divided political climate in this great country associated with those campaigning for the office of President of the United States. On the Democratic side, we have Hillary Clinton. If elected, she will make history by being the first female to assume the Oval Office. As a former First Lady, Member of Congress, and Secretary of State, she has first-hand experience about how things work in Washington, D.C. However, she has been facing withering criticism associated with her personal credibility and whether she does or does not have close ties with Wall Street and big banking via moneyed allies who have supported her campaigns and who have paid her handsomely for speaking engagements. At the same time, she insists that if elected, she will rein in Wall Street's and big banking's excesses, suggesting that if necessary, she would be willing to disappoint her allies there. Hmm. Again, the principal word to consider when pondering Hillary Clinton's drive toward the White House is credibility. And if elected, will her husband, former President Bill Clinton, be content as our nation's first man in the White House? Or will he in fact become an unofficial behind-the-scenes co-president with Hillary, all the while exercising his own political power behind the scenes? Is it possible to have too much political power in the White House? Then there is the official Republican Party candidate for president, Donald Trump, who is actually publicly supported by some of the Republican Party. If elected, he will make history for, among other things, being the first reality TV personality and non-politician to assume the presidency. Many feel his adolescent-level criticisms and nicknames for his perceived and real enemies, his enmity of the media, his ready ability to assume controversial and often unpopular positions on various sensitive political topics, that is, when he doesn't flip-flop on an issue, as well as the many unprincipled and unstatesmanlike comments he has made about various people and organizations, all disqualify Trump as presidential material. Trump is smart and is keenly aware that his more inflammatory comments are quickly disseminated to the masses by the media. He knows that such comments keep him in the front of the news. The question is, will his apparent inability to restrain his rhetoric, to keep his mouth in check, be his undoing? Is Trump indeed his own worst enemy, and will he self-destruct before the election as he seems to be doing right now? Or is all of his blather just that of a carnival barker, a calculated in-joke for those in the know within the Republican Party? Maybe, as Trump frequently alludes, there is a bright and savvy businessman and future politician hiding just under his surface who is ready and capable of entering world politics and successfully leading this nation, all the while learning how to be presidential on the job. So if we were to choose Trump, just how would we keep the nuclear missile keys away from him until he has proven himself to be the credible and trustworthy leader of this country he claims that he will be? How will we know whether or not Hillary Clinton is telling us the truth that she is not in Wall Street's and big banking's pocket? How do we find these things out with any level of certainty before we have to make a choice for president in November? 
Right now, the upcoming presidential election is giving me a case of the deep, dark shivers as I wrestle to choose the better candidate in November, the one who will determine the future course of our country and perhaps the world. Bernie Sanders, wherefore art thou? Stephen Vieira, Soaking Internet Radio News. Soaking News was created based on a generous grant from J Labs Encore Media Entrepreneurs Program, supported with funding from the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation and the Nicholas B. Ottaway Foundation.